slurting. It's terrible. I have a terrible rote memory. My, my situation was I did terribly in high school. Um, I hated high school. I just wouldn't study. I would remember that, you know, my mother would send me to my room and say, you have to study. And I wouldn't study. I, I would refu- I'd do anything. I would be alone in the room. There would be, I'd find something to think about or do. And I wouldn't study. And I did terrible in, in high school. And I barely got into uh, a college that, um, C.W. Post College, which people, um, you know, it was just a, um, it, was, uh, it was a great college for me at the time. And it was only then that I could begin to pick my courses. So then I began to pick things that were interesting to me. Um, and then it was exciting. I loved it, right? And then, and you had the free time. Like college, you, you know, other school, most of the time, you know, you go at a certain time, the bell rings, you go to the next class, it's packed in. And in, in college, there was freedom. I always loved freedom. I remember when I got my car or whatever it would be, anything that brought me freedom, I loved. And so college allowed me freedom, the freedom to choose the subjects largely that I was interested in, the freedom of time. And so that, and so I did very well in college. And, and then I went to Harvard Business School. In the summer between, um, well, uh, between college and uh, going to Harvard Business School, I clerked on the floor of the stock exchange, which was in 1971 when there was the monetary system breakdown, and uh, which was an unbelievable experience. And, and it was, well, I, I was wrong many times in the markets up to that, but this was one of those really telling times. So you're, imagine you're, um, I, I watched it bef- uh, follow developments day by day up until the breakdown. And what I was seeing is that the world financial system, money as we knew it, dollars were not being accepted. We had large debts around the world and these dollars were not being accepted and um, a big crisis. Um, And it came to head on August 15th, 1971, when I was clerking on the floor of the exchange. And President Nixon, on Sunday night, gets in front of the television and announces uh, the floating of the dollar. In other words, we're going off the gold standard. And at that time, uh, money had no value except as um, a claim against gold because money was like checks in your checkbook, right? It had no value, no intrinsic value. So now there was going to be the severing of the relationship. It's like now you can keep the checks, but you can't have the money that's in the bank. And so that, I figured, wow, what a shock. And I walked on to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange where I'm clerking, and um, I come there, and the stock market went up the most it ever went up in a long time, in many years. Um, And that was the first time that happened. And I said, I, I wasn't prepared for the fact that this was a currency devaluation. People at the time, none of us, really understood the relationships because it never happened in our lifetimes before. So I started to do research. I always wanted to understand how it made sense, and I realized that there were currency devaluations that happened many times in history. So, for example, in 1933, in March of 1933, in the Great Depression, the same thing happened for the same reasons. There was too much debt, and they had to print money. And when you print money, you have this kind of effect. And these experiences then, all through my uh, development, I found that there were many things that had never happened in my lifetime before, or the lifetime of the people that I was operating with, the marketplace. The people in the market, mostly, uh, were very, very much um, responsive to their experiences, particularly their more recent experiences. So, it was a pattern that I would see um, of surprise. We would be surprised because we were stuck in our presumption that our recent experiences were going to continue. 
what I learned is uh, what I learned is to be surprised. Another, I learned by the surprises, and then when I when I was surprised, it's only because I didn't understand the cause effect relationship. Everything happens because there's this co- there are causes to make it happen. Everything, right? Okay, now what I looked at each one of those and said, that thing, did it ever happen before? And I went back in history and I saw these things happening before for the same cause-effect relationships. And then I realized that everything, everything that happens is just another one of those, right? The same thing happens. It may be, um, I don't know, if you're skiing and you make a turn, that's called skiing and make a turn, and there is one of those, and they repeat. Okay, so then when, how does reality work? What's the cause-effect relationship? So that if you're encountering one of those, a learning experience, um, I don't know, anything, a birth, a marriage, a, an economic downturn, um, if you encounter any of those, they have all happened before, a deleveraging. So that's why um, we anticipated the deleveraging. Before, uh, before the uh, 2008 downturn in the economy, uh, we, it's a very good example of what we're talking about. Um, uh, it, there's a machine. Everything works like a machine, meaning they're the cause-effect relationships. Um, so in order to understand the machine and understand it through time, you have to ex- see how those cause-effect relationships work, particularly big events. Deleveragings have happened throughout history. You can go back thousands of years, hundreds of years. They always have happened because there's a certain nature to um, a debt cycle and how that works. When, when debt rises faster than income, uh, you get to spend more. So l- l- I'll, I'll explain it in, in, in brief. Let's Let's imagine you're earning $100,000 a year and you have no debt. Then I can go out and borrow because I have no debt. I can go to the bank and I can borrow. And let's say they lend me $10,000 a year. So now I have $110,000 a year that I could spend. When I spend that $110,000, somebody else earns $110,000. So that causes their earnings to go up. As their earnings go up, they also can go to the bank. And so you build a cycle in which debt rises faster than income. Most importantly, that debt rises faster than the ability to service income. So that is a self-reinforcing upward cycle. It causes asset prices to rise because if incomes are rising, companies are doing better. So their earnings do better. And so people um, with debt can buy goods, services, or financial assets. And those things cause them to go up. So there's a debt expansion. But obviously, debt can't rise faster than income forever. Usually, when we had um, a downturn, you'd lower interest rates. Because lowering interest rates would have stimulative effects on the economy. First, when you lower interest rates, it has the effect of uh, making it easier to service your debt. Lower interest rates make it easier to service the debt. Also, it makes items that are bought on credit cheaper. Your monthly payments go down. If you buy a car or a house, your monthly payments go down if interest rates are lower. So it makes it cheaper, meaning you could afford more. So it stimulates the economy. And it also has the effect of raising assets prices. Because assets, um, if you have an income stream, it could be renting a property, you're comparing it with the going interest rate. And if the interest rate goes down, the value of the asset goes up. So it has a wealth effect. So as the economy works, when there were lower interest rates, it would have the effect of stimulating an economy. And that stimulated economy really stimulated debt growth and therefore purchasing on debt, and it raises. So the economy always has gone through these cycles in which uh, interest rates go up, when they're trying to slow the economy, interest rates go down when they're um, trying to stimulate the economy. Um, however, when interest rates get close to zero, it doesn't work. So 
You have a lot of debt. Debt is rising faster than income. Can't go on forever. Can't lower interest rates. They hit zero. And the world changes. So that's the basic cause-effect dynamic. So in 2007, 2006, 2007, it was very clear we were in a bubble. But like all of these uh, situations, people at the time very much get carried away with what's happening at the time. Like 2005, six, everybody says the stock market goes up, it's a great investment, uh, because it went up. They don't realize it's more expensive. <laughs> Going up may make it more expensive. But no, they look back and they say, it's a great investment, or houses, or I can go borrow money and, and, and buy houses and do this. But they don't think about the paying back and how that works. This is human nature. This has happened through hundreds and thousands of years. And so they get to the point where interest rates can't go down, there's not a rectifying of the problem, and you begin a deleveraging. And then the process begins to work in reverse. A deleveraging means no longer can you raise income faster, excuse me, no longer can you raise your debt faster than your income. So if you can't, you have to slow your debt, you have to slow your spending. So as you slow your spending, you're slowing somebody else's income. And, and when I say you're, you're, it's the purchase of goods, services, and financial assets, and as you slow the purchases of goods, services, and financial assets, the economy goes down and the assets go down. And as the assets go down and the incomes go down, there's more of a need to cut your spending. And so it begins to build... Um, a self-reinforcing negative cycle. There's not enough money in the system. There's not enough money in the system because, uh, again, um, just just think of it. There's spending, and spending could be paid for either by money or credit. So if you go into a store and you're buying something, let's say I'm buying a suit, I can pay for it either by credit or I can pay by money. If I pay by credit, it's a promise to deliver money. If I pay by money, my transaction's complete. But since I can pay by credit, I can stimulate the demand, I can have a strong economy, but I owe money. And so the owing of the money means that uh, when, when I can no longer produce credit and I have to go get money, I need more money in the system. And when you have a zero interest rate, then the central bank is stuck because this deleveraging will continue to feed on itself. It will continue, um, I don't spend, you don't earn, it goes down. Can't service my debts because I don't have enough money to service my debts. Banks get in trouble because the person who they lent them the money too doesn't pay back. What is a bank? A bank is a very simple thing. People gather, they put money in a bank. That person goes and lends it, to, that bank goes and lends it to some other people and they then hope to get paid back at a higher interest rate. That's what it is. And so when those people can't pay back because they don't have, because that credit cycle starts to work in reverse and they can't pay back, then the banks get in trouble. They lose money. And when they lose money, then they're bad banks. And the whole system works so you see that um, at the same time as there's a contraction in credit, there is a stock market falling because you need to sell assets. And because of the contraction in credit and people are spending less, earnings of companies go down, so the companies are worth less. And because of then the, the debt problems, the banks don't do well, so we have a banking crisis. So you see that that deleveraging happens and in, in the ways that we're used to happening. Uh, the debt, private sector debt doesn't increase. Uh, spending is less. Uh, banks get in trouble. Markets go down and so on. And it's not enough money. The central bank lowers interest rates. Interest rates hit zero. They're stuck. So that's a deleveraging. And that's a, dep that's a depression part of a deleveraging. Take the 30s, take Japan's deleveraging. These are iconic deleveraging and are deleveraging. At first, 
um, austerity is the path because you realize, oh, debt is a problem. And what we all have to do is uh, stop um, getting into more debt. That becomes obvious. We can't continue to do that. So we go through the austerity. But as we go through that austerity, there's a feedback loop because that lack of spending, that lacking of debt, causes somebody else's income to go down. Okay, so then there's a, there's a problem because of the debts. So we go to, we encounter a lot of debt defaults. And we think about uh, restructuring debts. Those debt defaults means, okay, how do we re-enter an agreement in which we can get past that, that you can pay what you can afford? And so there's a, a, a debt restructuring, a lot of debt restructurings. But the debt restructurings also don't help because, well, they help to some extent, but they, they, they also bring with them problems because one man's debts are another man's assets. So if I lower your debt, let's say I'm uh, uh, we do a restructuring, you can pay half. Your mortgage, you come in, we'll readjust your mortgage, and you can pay half. Uh, then I have to write down that mortgage. And so my wealth goes down. And as my wealth goes down, I can borrow less, 